Hi everyone, Stepan here. It's Friday, so welcome to another Friday Million video. Uh, today I want to talk about a topic that is very complicated and I was quite struggling to apply this to my own games and to my own play. I still am and I'm trying to improve in this respect. Therefore, I was uh, trying to find games that uh, have a visible difference between static and dynamic weaknesses or static and dynamic strengths. It's basically the same thing, just depending on the perspective. So for one side, a static weakness is a weakness. For the other, it's an advantage and vice versa. So we are going to talk about weaknesses uh, that are static, which can be exploited later on in the game, with which you don't have to rush, with which you don't have to react straight away. Same goes for advantages. So if you have a static advantage, meaning that uh, you have a position in which your opponent's king side has been completely shattered, you have a static advantage of a safer king, for example. Or if you have a good knight versus bad bishop position out of the Sicilian, where you have a hole on d5 for your knight, and your opponent has a bishop on e7, well, then that's a static advantage, which isn't going away. On the other hand, if you have a dynamic advantage, which you need to act upon immediately or your opponent uh, is going to save himself, uh, then, then that's a whole different story. We're going to look at three very famous games. Uh, I, I fear that you will know all three because they have been covered almost everywhere. I mean, they're just very famous games. Probably the first one, Spassky Averbach, is not as famous. Uh, although I could be wrong. Ryshevsky Petrosyan and Geller Svet in... Yeah, they were covered everywhere. And they featured three different types of static or dynamic weaknesses slash advantages, however you want to look at it. So let's start. Uh, one important thing to understand during the game is firstly where your advantages or weaknesses lie, because that's the only way to plan accordingly and plan uh, and find the correct plan, either a negative or a positive plan. Again, a positive plan is something that you want to do. A negative plan is something with which you prevent your opponent from doing what he wants to do. So knowing where your advantages and weaknesses lie is an absolute necessity for understanding what you should be doing. Now, the second step is to understand how urgent uh, is the thing you have to do and how quickly you have to react before you a lose the game b lose your advantage depending on whether we are talking about weakness or or a strength so let's start in this position Sp boris spassky is white here yuri averbach is black and in this position boris spassky played the move f4 and when i was analyzing this position for the first time um, i couldn't understand why averbach would play the move knight c4 which he played in the game so let's discuss his options. So his options are knight c6, knight g6, or knight c4. What happened in the game resulted in a static advantage for white. So black played knight to c4, and Spassky simply took it. Now, uh, taking with the rook is possible, but it's harder to, uh, to defend the weakness on d6 after that. So here, was, uh, here is what I think would have happened. So b3 rook to c7, and now knight to f3, and you simply put pressure on the weakness on d6. Okay, so in the game, uh, b takes was taken, and we are going to see how this static advantage of a much better pawn structure for white, or a static disadvantage for a much worse pawn structure for black was exploited by, by Spassky. But first, let's, let's have a look, a quick look at the other two options. So, for example, if knight c6 is played, which to me seems like the most reasonable move, then funnily enough, this leads to a very strong dynamic advantage for white. Okay, so watch what happens. So white takes and bishop takes and now e5. And after e5, if you don't want to be stuck with an isolated pawn on d5, which is going to be blocking your bishop as well, then you take. But now after f takes e5, this is a dynamic advantage. Why? Because white has this torn pawn on e5, which is sort of creating outposts for the white pieces in the middle of black position. This bishop is amazingly strong. These rooks can infiltrate uh, on the d-file or on the f-file, on the 6th rank, 7th rank, wherever. And this is a dynamic advantage which white is going to have to exploit quickly. Otherwise, um, black can play, play, for example, bishop d7, bishop e6, trade off the bishops, blockade with the rook on e6, trade everything off, and be simply winning, because this pawn is a weakness, which, for example, in the king and pawn ending, the king can just pick off and, and win. So knight c6 would have led to a dynamic advantage. 
The other option after f4 was knight to g6, and here I, I think uh, the advantage positionally would be just too big, and you can call it whatever you want, but after the move f5, knight e sorry, knight e5, bishop d5, white is just dominating the whole board here. Much better bishop, the knight is going to be traded off anyway, if white wishes to do that, and th this is just a big advantage, and even ideas of g4, g5. So this I would call a long-term static advantage if I had to, because I'm going to have a better bishop than you, or I'm going to have a better queen, or whatever captures on d5 eventually is going to be better than the rest of your pieces. But okay, let's get back to the game. So knight c4 played, and Spassky takes, and Avruk uh, takes... Uh, not Avruk, excuse me. I've been working a lot from Avruk's uh, Catalan and d4 books, trying to understand some theory. So I, I, yeah, I mixed up the two. Averbach, excuse me, took with the pawn. And now let's let's talk about where the advantage lies. Here, white pieces are simply better than black pieces. Firstly, uh, the rooks for the moment are better. The knight is better placed than the bishop because the bishop doesn't really have uh, such a good square. But that's a dynamic thing. If black is given time, the rooks can centralize, the bishop can either exchange itself for the knight somehow or find a better square. But what's static in this position and what's a long-term advantage is the pawn structure. And white's plan can be a slow motion sadistic plan which takes 20 moves. Why? Because black is unable to change the nature, the nature of the position. Black is unable to repair the pawn structure. These, uh, these pawns, these two pawn islands in the center, the one on a6 and one on c4 and d6, is irreparable. It's basically game over for these pawns and white is given enough time to exploit the static advantage. Spassky did it perfectly. He started with knight to e2. Uh, and this knight simply centralizes uh, on c3 and looks at the square d5, not to infiltrate it perhaps, because then the bishop could trade itself off, but to simply blockade and stop any ideas of d5, because that would change the nature of the position and improve the pawn structure, and to be able to put more pressure on d6, and eventually d6 is going to fall. Bishop a4, which is, I mean, it's, it's sort of like a spite check. You attack my rook and I move it, so what? So, I mean... Rook c1, rook fd8, and now knight c3, and now this pawn is not moving, this pawn is not moving, this bishop has to lose a tempo. Rook c to d1, now the, the rook returns back to its ideal outpost, because the knight is controlling this one. h6, and now queen e3, and slowly but surely, white pieces are starting uh, to attack. Rook to b8, rook to e2 defending, rook b to c8, rook to d4. And now the first glimpses of an attack... Bishop to b7, defending c4, rook e to e2, queen to e7, queen to g3, and now you can see that the pressure on d6 is already getting to be a bit too much. King f8 played and f5, and Spassky did this perfectly, so he understood what the position was about. Unfortunate for Averbach that nothing worked after f4, that the best in his mind was to go for this static disadvantage, this static weakness of the pawn structure. And now it's just over. Uh, he played rook e8, which I, I'm not sure what, what rook e8 is. Spassky now just took on d6 and went on to win easily. So this, I was... I was fascinated when I was looking at this game for the first time. So after f4... Basically no good option for black. He goes knight c4 and bishop c4, bc4. And now, if you recognize this as a critical moment in the game, not dynamically. M most people think of critical moments as I have to do something now or I don't win or I lose. I think there are critical moments in static positions as well. If you can... Um, if you can be smart enough and see deep enough to recognize that this position is when the position changed into something static, something exploitable long term, then you will be able to take 10, 20, 30 minutes, doesn't matter, come up with a good plan and then and then just play all of your moves automatically. I think Spassky probably did that here. Or maybe he was just too strong and he felt that knight c3 and, and rook e2, rook d4, blah, blah, blah. I, I was fascinated by this one. Okay, the second game uh, is... Uh, excuse me. Uh, why do Leech's studies sometimes change uh, the, the main lines? I don't understand it. 
Okay, this is the game Reshevsky Petrosyan from Zurich 53. You have to know this game. I mean, it's probably one of the most famous Petrosyan games. So Petrosyan's playing black. He's obviously much worse. He's getting crushed here. Why? Because white has the bishop pair, white has a huge space advantage, white has a potential passed pawn, and or white actually does have a passed pawn, excuse me, on the d-file. And white's rooks are better, white's pieces are better, and just everything is in white's favor. Okay, rook f to one plate. But let's talk about uh, white's advantage here. So Semi Reshevsky has a dynamic advantage. Why? Because if he doesn't do something with what he has in this position, and black is able to sort of consolidate, create counterplay on the queen side, and maybe mess the position up in the center, or even better, if he is able to play, for example, move this rook away, play knight e7, knight to d5, then all of a sudden this dynamic advantage for white, which was providing him attacking play, turns into something very... Uh, what's the word? The water in a swamp is stale and putrid. I wanted to, to say something like that. It's something that's just rotting in a very bad way. And, and these rooks, uh, if black is given time, these rooks are going to be absolutely nothing. So this is a dynamic advantage which, which has to be exploited now. Otherwise, as we said, black can uh, A, reroute the knight to d5 and just block out the rooks, make this bishop stupid, make this, these pawns in the center immobile, and then he could switch to his counterplay with b4, create a passed pawn of his own, and, and just have a very comfortable game. So Petrosian finds an incredible way to do that. Now, engines don't think it's the best move, uh, they don't think it's bad. It's one of the it's one of the best options. I've actually uh, had a look at the game with an engine as well. He plays the move rook to e6. And again, wh when I was looking at this game for the first time, I was fascinated. Now I never read Zurich 53, even though I wanted to, because even though it's one of the most famous books and people say it's great, I've read some reviews where, where people say it's just overrated and it was one of the best books then and it stayed popular. So I don't know. But I, I plan to read it. But anyway, uh, in this position, rook e6 played. And now what does this move do? Well, it stops e3. Uh, let's see what white would have done if black just underestimates the threat and doesn't see that white's dynamic, dynamic advantage is exploitable immediately. So let's say black plays, I don't know, a4. White plays e6. And now, after e6, what do you do? If you take it, you are worse. If you play f6, then, I mean, we don't have to look at that. If you take it, then, for example, bishop takes, bishop f7, bishop f5, rook e3, rook e3, yeah, passed pawn, better rook, better pieces. The bishop can route via c1 to g5. I, I think if black doesn't react at the point at which Petrosian played rook e6, then he's just worse. So he played rook e6, and now that stops e6, obviously. And more importantly, it gives his knight the route to get into d5. Now, if, if it's taken uh, bishop e6, f6, something like rook g3 trying to attack, knight e7, maybe queen g5, I don't know, knight d5, then black is just better. White has the exchange, Okay, so white has the exchange, so in any endgame he's going to be better, but how do you use your rooks here? Rooks need open files, rooks need space, rooks need uh, room to maneuver, basically, and a knight needs an outpost, so here the knight is safe and sound on d5, it's not going anywhere, and who would rather have this rook than this knight? I mean, nobody. So, for example, rook f1, queen e7, okay, let's trade off queens, knight e7, rook gf3, knight d5. You don't have any infiltration points. Black is not winning, of course, but black is never losing this position. That There's just no way. In fact, if white gets carried away, then, then I could win with a passed pawn. So, yeah, after rook e6, uh, a4 was played in the game. Uh, which I think is good uh, by, by Reshevsky. Uh, more importantly than breaking up this pawn structure was to get the bishop in play. 
Okay, so knight e7 going into d5. Now the pawn is taken, the, the exchange is taken, and queen f1. Queen f1 attacks c4, so makes it harder to advance. I think instead of queen f1, just rook f3, trying to be more active, and something like b4, d5, probably e d5 would would be good or better for white that than what happened in the game because the the exchange is much easier to exploit because the the pawn is passed and and there are open files for the rooks but queen f1 played and now after knight d5 rook f3 bishop d3 played yeah very very hard to play reshevsky in fact gave the gave the exchange back i think if he doesn't these two pieces are just dominating the two rooks easily so let's return to the original position so in this position Reshevsky has an advantage it's a dynamic advantage which has to be exploited now or if we want to say weakness Petrosian has a dynamic weakness okay he is about to get crushed with e6 he needs to solve the issue there was no other way in his mind to stop all the threats so rook e6 very pragmatic very sensible like this is the problem i have this is how i can solve it fine okay and the last game is um okay so this is an iqp position uh, in which uh, fm geller is playing sweating uh, this is a moscow teams championship or something like that in 1981 uh, and it's an iqp position in which white is simply dominating now uh it's black to play uh black played queen to d8 uh, because well okay d5 threatened now the isolated queen's pawn is a strength and a weakness at the same time depending on what you do with that and depending on what your opponent does with it so if the pieces get traded off into an end game and and black is able to trade off the major pieces and just win the pawn then the pawn is a weakness uh, a static weakness and you lose if you checkmate black then it's a dynamic advantage so in this position White has a lead in development, White has a safe king, White has the bishop pair, White has the pawn on d4 which is allowing him to control e5 and c5 and stopping the black pieces from coming to those squares. And it also gives him the option of pushing d5, which at the correct moment could break open the position. So I chose an IQP game and one of my favorites because this is a static weakness and a dynamic strength at the same time. So now let's look at a continuation that wasn't played in the game i will play moves which i think are bad for white which will turn this pawn into a static weakness so let's say rook to e1 perfectly normal let's say black castles let's say you play queen to d2 connecting your rooks fine uh, black plays knight to d5 when your opponent has an isolated pawn you want to blockade it put the pawn under lock and key blockade it win it later you cannot win it outright for example bishop g5 uh, queen to b6, putting pressure on d4, let's say rook a to c1, let's say knight c to e7, reinforcing the blockade, uh, and maybe knight a5 or queen a5 or something. In this position, I wouldn't call this pawn a strength anymore. Uh, maybe, I mean, white is not worse, white is still slightly better because of the bishop pair and more active pieces, but white definitely played passively, he gave black enough time to defend, to blockade, to regroup. If black is given a couple of more moves, then, then the pawn really does become weakness. But Geller played excellently. The first move was queen h5, and queen h5 simply puts pressure on the entire board, uh, and threaten stuff like d5, threaten stuff like if castles, of course, uh, queen takes h7, so stopping black from castling. The first thing he is doing, he is making sure that black cannot consolidate by putting his king to safety. If the king is in the center, then d5 is a much scarier move, then bishop h7 is scarier, then bishop g5 is scarier, knight c5, and, and stuff like that. So knight d5 played, Alexei Sweden is, of course, not a better, he blockades the pawn bishop g5 when you're playing for a dynamic advantage you don't want to trade pieces off knight c to e7 reinforcing the blockade fine we are getting somewhere rook f to e1 why is this move important may seem bad well casting is still impossible so maybe if this is taken and if this is pushed this rook is going to have some influence on the e file if the king is still in the center h6 played that doesn't do anything the bishop is not threatened because of queen takes rook so rook a to d1 Queen d6, uh, 
I'm not really sure what this move does. I don't think it does much. And now if you want, pause the video and it's basically a sequence that you could call white to play and win, but it's not forced enough for it to be a puzzle. So, but pause the video, how do you continue with white? Okay, uh, so Geller continued bishop e7, knight e7, of course if you take with the queen, then bishop takes knight wins the game outright. So knight e7, no d5. And yeah, you, you can resign. That's it. If you push e5, then I think knight a5, knight c4, and, and again, you win this pawn, you win the game. Eventually this pawn is just going to queen, sorry. Uh, and after d5, Swetin played e takes d5, and now bishop takes d5. Uh, I mean, what do you do? The knight is pinned, of course. You, yeah. Queen f6 played, and now if you want again find the winning move, the last move of the game, uh, bishop takes f7. And on move 20, black resigns. Uh, let me just show you what happens on queen takes. If queen takes, then of course rook d8 check, king f8. Or sorry, king takes uh, d8 and queen takes f7. So, yeah, coming back to this position. Here, black had a dynamic weakness, meaning that white has a dynamic advantage. If he utilizes it quickly, black is going to be in trouble. On the other hand, if white plays passively, he is going to have a static disadvantage, a static Okay, I hope this video helps. I would encourage you to find games with similar ideas, uh, with weaknesses and strength, uh, strengths, which are static and dynamic, because that way you will start recognizing them more easily. And once you get the feeling about what's urgent and what's not, I think plan creation is going to become easier for you. Thank you very much. Uh, see you next week and stay tuned for more chess. Bye-bye.